You're listening to The Crunch with Cam Slater. Right here on RCR, Reality Check Radio. Liam Hare is a staunch National Party supporter, but he describes himself as a little squishy these days. He wrote a memo to Christopher Luxon, so we'll discuss that, along with his thoughts about the election campaign, the results, and where to from here. He's on the line now to discuss the results of the election with me. Welcome to The Crunch. Hello. Good to have you here. I've been following your articles, your sub stack and your tweets, and uh, you know, I've always had a bit of a, a soft spot for some of the points that you make, even if you are you know, a blinkered, sycophantic National Party uh, person. <laughs> that's about the level of beat up you're going to get from me today. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I think that's completely fair. Um, you know, I think, I mean, over the years, I started out writing about politics in 2013, so 2011 for, um, you know, um, the mandatory standard and stuff and things like that. And at the, at the time, I've always been a National Party sort of guy, like, you know, dairy farmer's son, and that's sort of just, you know, sort of the tribe that I belong to, I guess. But I certainly was a lot more um, right wing than I than I am now. And, uh, I, and, and the reason why I've sort of become a lot less um, sort of, outspoken or a lot less um, sort of radical is simply just I've become really pessimistic over the years. I've become really pessimistic about what can be achieved politically. And um, so my standards are just a lot lower um, and, you know, and it's, it's, a, it's a loss of hope really. <laughs> like I, I, had a, I did an interview with Damien Grant and he just said, you're just supporting the National Party out of, um, you know, uh, sort of not believing that better, better things are possible. And I was like, yeah, that, that's basically me right now. Yeah, it's, it's interesting you said it because people accuse me of being a, you know, a tribal National Party uh, supporter, but they clearly haven't kept up with developments um, at least since 2014, uh, where effective, well, you know- effectively I felt the National Party, um, you know, chucked me under the bus uh, to suit a political narrative, and not whilst I accept that at some point, it opened my eyes up to the fact that I believe that they're the party of the status quo. They very rarely make significant changes and they like to tout themselves as efficient managers of the economy Mm -hmm. of the things that the Labour Party did. (laughs) So I think that's that's completely, and that's completely fair. And, And so first of all, like, you know, you've never really been a national party sycophant like, like I am. Right. Like even back in the um, in the glory days, like, you you know, you were always involved in the internal strife within the party. You know, yeah. like it wasn't like a party line. You know, you weren't David Farrer because um, the quickest thing for David is a friend of mine, too, is that, you know, whenever if, if you want to see what way the wind is blowing, you know, look to where Ki- Kiwi blog is and that's where the National Party is going with things. But that was never really the case with your old blog. No. Um, but but for me personally, like I just think, yeah, you're right. And, you know, the National Party doesn't um, – it, it makes changes at the margins and, and historically sometimes it has rolled back big things. Um, but what you're getting out of the National Party is a slower – um, a slower acceleration towards the cliff, perhaps, and you know, more skillful driving, but it's not going to fundamentally change the politics of this country. But I, I've always had the view, um, you know, it's like what that guy Andrew Breitbart said that if you have a fundamentally left wing media, you have a left wing um, uh, civil society, all the charities are left wing, um, you turn on TV, you're getting left wing messages, you, you can't expect that the elected government is going to be anything other than sort of. Uh, soft left and so I've always just felt that politics has been about choosing between the least worst alternative really and I know it's really like not inspiring right but it's just it's just where I've got to in life yeah it's 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 the old saying is that you have to learn to swallow dead rats Um, but you know it's funny you mentioned Andrew Breitbart because many years ago uh, this left wing uh, foghorn on on Twitter as it was then uh, had his own blog, a guy called Peter Aranyi had a meeting with me. He said, you know what, you're just like Andrew Breitbart. And he was meaning it as an insult. Yeah. And <laughs> and uh, I thought, hang on a second, this guy's a multimillionaire. He's founded a news mm-hmm. network. Uh, he's talked about all around the world. Uh, yeah, that sounds like me. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. 
So you know, like Peter Arrhenia is kind of weird. He had a thing where he would would, would would go after me for a long time. Is he still kicking around? Is he does he do? Yeah, he's still? he's very obsessive. Hmm. A strange man who who when you meet him, his first thing he says is, "I used to work with Paul Holmes," and my answer to that was, "So yeah. what?" <laughs> yeah. so, like in the nineties, <laughs> what a thing to hang on to. <laughs> I know, you know. Um, it yeah. seems he has a falling out with almost everybody, and uh, he seems yeah. to be a very bitter man. Very smart. Yeah. Um, can be erudite as well, but just bitter and snarky. And you know, there's unfortunately there seems to be a lot of humorless people on the left, and. You know, I look back on the things that have been described about me, you know, especially by Nikki Hager, who's probably the most bitter person I've ever met. But, you know, he, he he wrote a book and said there was this vast conspiracy of people that were working to do this and do that and undermine that. And, but because he never asked us what why we did what we did uh, when mm. we were writing. <laughs> and if he had, I would have said, for fun. I'd do it for fun. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I've I've got to confess I've never like I personally never had anything that very pleasant interactions with him. Um, possibly because I'm trying to make sure he never writes a book about me. Um, but my criticism of of him <laughs> is that you know if you're doing journalism, you know like you you need to put the other side. You know yeah. you need to put it to the other side, right? And so I think there's this fear that you know that um you know somehow there'd be an injunction taking out prohibiting the publication of the book, which means that. You know, rush to press, keep it under wraps. Don't tell the other people that the book's being written about them, and don't get their side of it. And there were some. There were some. Well, I think you know the the one that I think was quite bad. Well, you know, one that sticks in memory anyway is um, the the Princess Party allegations and dirty politics, where you know there was some party in Palmerston North of all places that Farrah was going and. But without context, it sounded like it was some sort of nefarious, you know, hitting on girls while the drunk thing. But it turned out it was just, you know, it was about the royal wedding. And it's exactly uh, you know, what it was. Those, it was a royal wedding. Yeah. There was about twenty people in a room uh, having a few beers, and it was the most boring party out. In fact, I went elsewhere uh, because it was just so like national party people are pretty boring, really. Yeah, and uh, mm-hmm. you know. Um, that was just nothing, and it was blown out of context. You're right; it was blown out of context. It was pathetic. Yeah. Um, and it, the and National Party been... people are very boring. Oh yeah. You're, you're right about that. Like you know, people think that the average National Party person is like some, you know, um, uh, plutocrat in a shark skin suit, but it's actually normally some old man in a woolly jumper, um, you know, with um, old man breath. Or a young net nerd, you know, like it's it's uh, you know people have these ideas about the national party. You can tell that they've never ever been to a single national party conference. Uh, yeah, and I've done plenty of those, you know, and um, but I, you know, I'm no longer a member of the national party, so maybe I should hand in my seal skin hubcaps. <laughs> are you a member of any party, or are you? No, I'm not a member. Never going to go any... down that path again. No, I'm never going to go down that path again. I've thrown partisan politics aside. I'm actually enjoying what we're doing here at Reality Check Radio. And yes, yep. I, I have my opinions. I have my views. I have my own personal biases, but it's not um, attributable to any one party. Or any, and, you know, I've been accused of being mm. a Winston Peters sycophant, but if only, yeah. they could, um, if only they could make a GoPro that would last nine hours and we'd just set it up and watch um, Winston and I over a, a couple of uh, – whiskeys and some cigars just absolutely going hammer and tongs at each other disagreeing with each other mm-hmm. you know and that's the yeah. thing that i think is missing from new zealand politics these days is the ability to discuss things with people that you might be implacably opposed to but you can have a civil discussion about it yeah i do agree with that and uh it's one one thing that's really interesting though is you know, I do, every now and then I'll do a bit of TV work and I'll do Q and A or or the Nation or whatever. And in the green room, you, you'll sometimes meet people that you've have had go at you on social media, and and the the most the, the biggest pussies. And yeah. you know, like you know, like when it comes to fronting up in yep. person, yeah, the, the nice as anything. You know, it's only the the cowardice of social media that makes them horrible. And uh, you know, I think that's part of why it, why it's so toxic, right? Like you know, people, most people. Most like my wife's a you know a, like a green Labour Party sort of voter. We talk about politics very very rarely. Occasionally we do, but but actually you know what people have more in common 
um, then then they have in, indifference. People say, "How can you be married to like the school teacher?" Sort of sometimes green vote. I'm like, we, we, we talk about our kids. We have other things going on in our life. We're not losers who like you know uh, dominated by politics all the time. And therefore, when we do talk about politics, we can do so not hating each other. That's I think you're absolutely right about that. Yeah, you're calling me a loser here. <laughs> um, I'm saying, I'm saying we're all losers. If we weren't losers, we would be interested in things that were more fulfilling instead of things that were just frustrating. Oh, you know, we're, right. all, yeah, we're I mean, all losers. I mean, I love, I love. I'm the, I'm the number one loser. No, I, I wouldn't say that. You've got a successful law practice, so you can't be that much of a loser, mind you. Then again, so is Greg Presland. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope to be as much of a winner one day as Greg. <laughs> Oh dear, um, yeah. It's it's funny you talk about the green room because I've always uh, viewed the green rooms in media, and it's it's a number of years since I've done that. In fact, it'd be more than you know, basically since twenty fourteen. So what's that? Seven years? Uh, no more. Eight years. Yeah. So um, whenever I was in the green room, I used it as an opportunity to sledge very hard and very robustly those people. So that they got wound up like a clock spring, and then when you go on with them, uh, they're still wound up. And then I adopt yeah. a patient and calm demeanour. You know, <laughs> they they look uh, uh, completely manic. And if you want to have a look mm-hmm. at at the results of something like that, go and have a look at uh, at a na- uh, it was on the Nation. It was in 2012. And I was on with Brian Edwards and Bill Ralston. Now you go and have a look at that video, and uh, and you'll see my calm demeanour, and you'll see Brian Edwards losing mm-hmm. it. And that's because I yeah. wound him up in the green room. There's a very good old book about that. It's called Gamesmanship, and it was a, this guy who wrote it. It was it's like you know it's hard to read because it's all old timey language. You know, you know, yeah. it's, it's it's not well written by today's standards, but it's all about the art of of winning by not cheating, but doing the next thing next to cheating. And, you know, in terms of how you, how you, how you, how you get one over people psychologically. Um, and, you know, it's things like, you know, if you're playing tennis with them and, you know, they, if they call the ball out, you know, how to react in a way that will, you know, just ruffle their feathers and you know, make them feel like, you know, they're being accused of cheating or being unfair, but without actually saying it and how yeah. you just really put people off their game. It's called yeah. It's called Gamesmanship. It's a it's a great little book. And maybe I should use that more often. Maybe I'd come across better on TV if I uh, if I was willing to play the game a, a bit more. Unfortunately, I'm a complete pussy too. So you know, here we go. I'm one of the people who's completely nice to people on uh, in the green room because uh, I, I I just can't stand the uh, awkwardness of of argument face to face. I've always been a writer rather than a talker. This is coming from a lawyer, you know, whose entire uh, life really revolves around arguments. Well, I, I'm a commercial, you know, I'm I'm a commercial lawyer, right? Like I, I'm always about trying to get the deal done, right? And the way you get the, get the deal done isn't by putting getting people's backs up, and no. it's about actually, it's about being constructive. It's about guarding your uh, client's interests, and but you know, your client wouldn't come to you if they didn't want a deal to be done one way or the other. I always kind of think of the law I do as this as the sort of solution oriented stuff. And, you know, if it gets to the arguments floor, if we, get, if we need arguments, then we, we give it to a barrister at that point. Mm. But, you know, like it's, I've never, I've, have you ever convinced anyone of a political point by getting their backs up and, and, and arguing with them and putting them in a position where they can't concede? Uh, I, I, I never have. I've always thought it's better to try and let them talk themselves into it by asking questions. And that's the approach that I prefer now with politics. You know, I've interviewed all sorts of people that I just do not agree with them in any way, shape or form, but just let them talk. And then we can, Mm. you know, like Chris Trotter and I have very good discussions, even though we're pretty much implacably opposed to, to the solutions or the, the differing solutions that we have. But, but the guy, but Chris and, you know, even Matt McCartan, they're, they're good people at heart. And they want yeah. the same results for New Zealand. They just have a different way of wanting to achieve yeah. those results. Mm. And, you know, you'd know in business uh, as much as in politics, there's no right way to do anything. There, there's a way. Oh, you're right. There's a way yeah. to do something, right? Let's let's find some common ground. On, and, and this is the thing that I find fr- so frustrating. We've nearly had 30 years of MMP, 
but we've still got this adversarial, you know, we're right, you're wrong, or we won, you lost, eat that type mentality in politics. When everybody who voted for MMP had this motherhood and apple mm-hmm. pie that they'll all work together now and be nice. It's an interesting point that you raise about that because I've often thought about it, which is, uh, you know, MMP was supposed to herald in, as you say, this sort of era of consensus-based politics, you mm. know, and it would be um, you'd have more working across the aisle because you'd have a multiplicity of parties represented in Parliament. But while we got the electoral system, but we kept the FPP mentality, you know, we we, we had we had 100 plus years of FPP in our political culture and you can't just graft, you know, a new electoral system onto it when the culture is still the same. And so something that was really interesting to me, and I just, I can't wonder if the dam, can't help but wonder if the dam's broken on it a little bit this election, is how, you know, we still had this long-term trend where we had all these little parties sort of in that sort of in the mid nineties mm. and they would all die out as the, you know, um, you know, Peter Dunn's career died out and all that sort of stuff. And there was this trend towards sort of back to a two party system. And then this election, it's kind of exploded all that, right. And you've got, um, you've got these minor parties winning electorate seats. And mm. I just wonder if, you know, we're finally starting to, we may be doing MMP as it was actually intended to be done, you know, which is, I think is bad because I'm against MMP, but we might finally be, you know, getting getting there as it was intended to be. Yeah, I'm a, I'm against MMP too, but we've had two referendums on this. <laughs> yeah, it is not changing. To change, right? So anytime you put put in a, a comment on a site or something about the electoral system, you'll always get somebody who says, "Oh, but we we'd be better with STV." It's look, it's pointless even talking about it. We're not having it. Yeah. I couldn't but, agree more. It's similar to um, – it's like fantasy politics, right? It's like it's like talking about a UBI or yeah. a wealth tax. It's, it's just, you know, like it's maybe it's a fun academic exercise, but, yeah. like, politics is actually about the, the practicalities of getting stuff done. And, you know, that's, that's always – you know, it's, it's the criticism. There's a, there a piece in the um, – in the spinoff today about how some there was a green voter who was saying, Oh, I've just realized now that, you know, voting for the greens isn't going to actually, you know, get a wealth tax. It's not going to get these big things done. <laughs> it's like, no, it never, it, it never was, you know, like it's the, the, you know, politics is always the big parties. They make the decisions on the big things. And if you want if a small party, you might get some concessions and the trick for the small parties is to get those, make those concessions as meaningful as possible. And that's why I'll be really interested to see what New Zealand First rings out of national this time round? Because I think New Zealand First is it's a really interesting position compared to where it's been in the past. Well, let's just dial, go back a little bit to 2017. And this is from, I'm interested in your perspective here as a National Party person, because in 2017, Bill English led the National Party. They came first, if you want to use you know that analogy. They had the, the most votes. The Labour Party came second, and they were a long way short of where National was, but them and the Greens plus New Zealand First added up to more than what National had. And Act and Act was only one seat you know, then. And so with the benefit of hindsight, uh, we can now look back and then say, well, did Winston Peters do the right thing? Now, a lot of National Party people on my website would say Winston Peters betrayed the country because he didn't go with the National Party. And I always thought that was rather arrogant from a national supporter to yeah. expect that Winston Peters would go with them because they were the largest party. What are your views on that? Uh, I, I think there was always a real cope, like that idea that the biggest party is owed the chance to form a government. It's just it's never been something that's ever been talked about until the National Party started being the biggest party, right? Like, yeah, you're yeah. right, that's sort of, that's the, born, that's the most unattractive part of the National Party coming out, which is the, the born to rule sort of mm. thing. And so, you know, as you say, Winston Peters was in a position where he could negotiate with both sides. Um, a negotiation is pointless unless you're realistically going to go with either side, you know, yeah. like it's, if, 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 there's no real negotiating unless you've got a walk away position. Right. And I just think the national party screwed up the negotiations, frankly, I think, you know, they, they, they had Stephen Joyce and Paula Bennett in the negotiation team. Mm-hmm. Winston Peters was suing Paul, like Paula Bennett at the time. So, you know, it may not have been the dream team in terms of like who they chose to negotiate, 
And then from my understanding, and I don't know if this is true or not, it's just an understanding I have, is that they basically insulted the guy by offering him, you know, all the baubles, thinking that's what he was all about. And that's such a such a fundamental misunderstanding of St. Peter's to think that he's he's just about that. Because he is about that. You know, the, the baubles are, are important, but like he he believes in stuff, right? Like he, he's not a complete grifter. Like he's got mm. beliefs. He, yeah. he, he wouldn't have had that political career he has had if he didn't fundamentally believe in stuff. But I just think the National Party just read it wrong and they just insulted him. And I think, you know, if there's any truth to the idea that they suggested he'd be the speaker this time around, you know, same mistakes again, you know, there just is. that inability that is, that to... That is exactly yeah. what they were doing. And, you know, and yeah. again, they're repeating the same mistakes. I mean... They were putting it about. I mean, it was hilarious. Right? Where I live, um, you know, a couple of floors above is a mate. He's a true blue gnat. And uh, just before the election, like the Thursday before the election, he was saying, oh, you know, it's terrible. We need to be voting for national because we need to have a government straight away because we need to get into it. We can't waste any time. And then over the weekend, uh, or this was the week before, then over the weekend we had Chris Bishop come out and say pretty much exactly that. And then I knew that this was a talking point that had been pushed out into the electorates to the supporters that we need to have an emphatic result so that we can get on with make you know governing because we we can't waste any time and i i said to my mate mate you're not aware of the statutory requirements we've got to wait 20 days for the for the special yeah. votes you know that's so anti democratic what you're saying you're asking a government to be formed. I mean, unless it was so totally emphatic like Labour was at the mm-hmm. end of, you know, in 2020. Yeah. The reality is, though, we've got this fractured electorate where Labour was really in it until the last six weeks and then it just collapsed. But, you yeah. know, you had the arrogance of national say, thinking that they were going to get a two-party solution when we haven't had a two-party solution in, like, forever. Yeah. Apart from that time where we had a one party solution. <laughs> you're yeah. right. And, and, every other and how did that all work? Every other election has been hung. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're right. Every, every single, if you take the definition of a hung parliament is a parliament in which no one party or pre agreed coalition of party yeah. uh, sort of wins on election night. So we've had every single election part by the, the previous one has been a hung parliament. So you're, you're, you're right there. In terms of that strategy, you know, in terms of saying you vote vote blue or you know get chaos or whatever. Uh, well, what I do know is I know I do know that was a deliberate strategy. Uh, I don't know how well it worked, but I, I, for one one piece of evidence that it was there was some thinking behind it. I'm pretty weak, but so my my wife she told me that she was probably going to vote for Labour. You know, just she's a school teacher type, but she's one of those people who has sort of strong feelings about Winston and sort mm. of is, she's quite anti. Um, and, you know, people have very polarized opinions about Winston and she's one of them. So she came to me and she said, honey, do you think, I, I, I said, look, I, I'm, I'm thinking maybe I need to vote national, which would be the first time ever in her life, to make sure that it's not a um, Winston Peters hung parliament, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I said, of course, I said to her, of course, honey, you must vote. Yes, that's right. You should vote for national. Um, that's the exact, exact right thing to do. Um, so I, she, she, I, I went away, um, came back the day after election, um, after being in Auckland for election day. And I said, how did you vote, honey? She said, I didn't vote in the end. I didn't, didn't you know, I just, I just couldn't bring myself to do it. I had other things to do. And I didn't, you know, I was, I was that sort of depressed about it. And, you know, I wasn't thinking, feeling great about it. So I just mm. didn't vote. So I just wonder, you know, whether or not, you know, like, how if that message was targeted at that sort of type of voter. I mean, it didn't work because we didn't get into the polls to vote for blue, but it might have kept her from voting red. I mm. don't know. We'll have to see how all that played out. I mean, there'll be a New Zealand election study that comes out and it's going to be really interesting to see. But you're right. I think, you know, it's always going to be the case this election that there was going to be. I mean, it's been obvious for about a year, right? There was going to have to be mm. national act in New Zealand first. It's what I've been saying for a year, and all these National and Act people were going, no, 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 it's going to be just National and Act. And, you know, at the end of twenty, you know, about October 2022, um, Act was sitting at 15, 16, even up to 18% in some polls. Yeah. Um, you, you have to say uh, that David Seymour had an appalling campaign, really. Thank you. Thank you for saying that because everyone keeps talking about ACT as if they had this great campaign on the basis that they won Tamaki. They, they added one extra MP. <laughs> you know, it was 
they, they went from being the most disciplined overperformers of the parliament to completely dropping the ball in the campaign. Completely. Yeah, they well, lost, let's, they lost let's so just many votes. Discuss that a little bit. I mean, let's just look at that because you're absolutely right. They were overperforming. They were the opposition. National was playing. Uh, we're just like Labor, but less crap, right? That was that was their game. That's the game that worked in 2008 yeah. for John Key. They were John Key was advising Luxon right through this election campaign. They yeah. were making themselves a very very small target. Um, they were the pitch to the electorate was we're like Labor, but less crap. And mm. they they actually forgot the next part of that is that they're actually asking people to vote for crap. Yeah. <laughs> right. But yeah. but ACT was the what the party that was performing. They had uh, got the uh, shooting community on board. Uh, they'd had a couple of MPs off the basis of that in the in the 2020 election. Uh, and they were polling in you know October, September, yeah. October 2022 at very high rates, and and people were actually talking about them catching up to national. And then so they you're right, and um, they they made huge inroads into the uh, rural farming sector. You know, at where I live, I mean, yeah. I went to so many visit with clients and, and on the farm, and so often you know they'd say, well, actually, you know what, I think we're going to vote for Act this time around. You know, it was like a real thing that is a national party. Saw it was sort of like worrying to me. I was like, you know, is the farm vote being sort of shaken loose in the National Party because of the strong political performance of David Seymour? But then in the campaign, I think they did a couple of things. First of all, they just they just started to believe their own bullshit a bit too much about <laughs> yeah. you know, and they got you know, like it was a sort of just got over their skis a bit and got ahead of themselves. But the other thing, classic mistake is, you know, get picking a fight with Winston Peters. Why the hell would you do that? Why would you make your campaign as the leader of the ACT Party uh, getting into a fight with Winston Peters, who is so much more of a talented politician than you, and, you, and you, you're bringing more and more attention, more and more contrast to Winston Peters, who's actually fundamentally quite a charismatic politician. And, you know, that billboard in Auckland, uh, you know, the Act Party billboard featuring Winston Peters, you know, saying don't get fooled again. For God's sakes, it could have looked like a New Zealand first. Um, well, it was, it, uh, you know, yeah, I, when I saw that, I thought, oh, that's awesome. That's a great billboard that Winston's put up. And then I, I, I yeah. phoned him, I said, oh, well done on the billboard. And he says, it's not mine. I said, what do you mean? He says, it's the Act Party's. And I said, well, it's got, a, <laughs> it's got a quote that you could have said. I said, you know mm. what you should do? Is you, I said to him, you should just start saying, yeah, yeah. Um, Axe got some good advice there. Don't get fooled again. You know, vote for New Zealand mm. first. So, you know, it was, you know what, you know what, was bizarre. <laughs> do you know what it reminded me of? It reminded me of um, of the referendum campaign in 2011 for MMP to go back to that. And uh, in fairness, I think a lot of us thought this was a good strategy at the time, which was to say, ditch MMP, don't make Winston – you know, the kingmaker, you know, remove his kingmaker status by getting rid of the EMP. And that was a, an election uh, uh, where Winston Peters was out of, he wasn't, he was he came back into parliament after being out of it. All it did was uh, sort of draw attention to Winston Peters and his enduring relevance to New Zealand politics. And a campaign where Winston doesn't need to have 30% of the population um, like him. You know, Winston, oh. Winston only needs 5%. Yeah. Between 5 and 10% is a great result. So the more and more attention you draw to Winston, the more and more you start fighting with him, the stronger you make him. And so what I wonder about ACT is, is ACT still a strong enough party as a party that it can look sort of introspectively at how its campaign went and it can learn those lessons? Or has it become so dominated by David Seymour and Brock Van Velden that, you know, like it's their party now? And so they'll they'll just have the sycophants who say, look, you know, you did great, it was amazing, you know, oh, you right. held up while national, yeah, yeah. And I and you know, if ACT is still a strong party, they'll take some serious lessons out of this campaign. But you know, I'm, I'm an eternal pessimist. So I, I doubt they will. Look, I I know a, a fair few people who are ACT supporters, and some who have actually been on the board of the ACT Party, and they've got nothing to do with the ACT Party now because of David Seymour and. Yeah, uh, especially you know, his behaviour during COVID, all of that sort of thing. But I don't think they had. What, do- what did he do? Well, he was suggesting that yeah. there were vaccination buses that would go door to door and drag people out of their homes oh. and vaccinate them, you know? 
Okay. Uh, his doctrinaire and arrogant uh, behaviour uh, towards the Wellington protests. Um, yeah. You know, all of that sort of stuff. And in the in, in ACT people, uh, in my experience, are generally uh, very libertarian, very free thinkers. Yes. And, Funnily enough. You know, and that's the thing. In 2022, David Seymour was running around the country holding free speech meetings. Mm. That's how they got the, the percentage up there. He was talking yeah. the he was talking the talk, but when it came to walking the walk, he was decidedly crippled in his outlook. Yeah. And, so I mean, so so to push my own barrow a little bit on on it too, like I think something that happened was like he's um like you know as as I, like I'm I'm one of the minority New Zealanders who's a church goer, right? I go to mass every Catholic. I go to mass every week, and um you know it's an important part of my life, even though mm-hmm. I you know, make lots of mistakes and I sin constantly, but it's still something that's important to me. And a lot of those people, obviously, you know, um, people of my tribe, you know, thinking national is not really that, you know, strong of a supporter of our liberties and all that. Yep. And I think there was a lot of people who, you know, who, who sort of in that way inclined who supported ACT, but Seymour is so arrogant about Christians and uh, antagonistic towards them uh, and he went and did, did an interview with Bob McCroskey. And what do you think about Bob? Oh, that was an Bob appalling McCroskey. interview. I know. And then, so then, you know, I'll tell you something. Do you know who's not going to insult religion, Christianity? Winston Peters. No. You know, you know it's just, Winston Peters is not no. that dumb. You know, like, I don't, I don't know what Winston's religion is. Probably nothing. But, like, he's respectful oh, no, he, enough. He, he has faith. Um, you know, I've had yeah. discussions with him about that. Um, well, he's uh, he's respectful enough, right? And it yeah. Seymour just doesn't, you know, doesn't respectful. I mean, Bob McCrossey yeah. is the most inoffensive person you can meet. I mean, he's congenial. He's um, yep. jovial. Uh, he talks about some serious things. But but the way David Seymour uh, acted in that interview was just appalling. You know, and, and yep. you know, as a person and, of and faith, I really now- struggle with politicians in in, yeah. um, in in general, and especially politicians who profess a faith. Uh, but are involved in politics, you know. And Christopher Luxon's one of those, where he's, you yeah. know, says he's a Christian, but when he's questioned on it, he get, he's very squishy indeed. And uh, mm. I don't know how you can exist in politics and have a Christian outlook on life, uh, because politics, by necessity, involves lying and deception and dissembling and yeah. <laughs> all these things, right? <laughs> Yeah, that's so interesting because I think that's exactly true, you know. And it's one reason. It's one reason out of many why I probably didn't never wanted to go into politics myself, despite thinking it would be quite fun in a lot of ways. You just have to make too many compromises, right? Like the way to get mm. power is to compromise, compromise way all the way through, and to the point where you know you're doing things that you say that you're diametrically opposed to because it's the expedient thing to do. Uh, I I don't like politicians talking about their religion for that exact same reason. I'd rather not know about it. But the thing is with Bob McCroskey is he's got thousands of followers, yeah. right? Like he does. Th- there's networks of thousands of people, and the ACT Party just doesn't have the margin to annoy people like that uh, when when they've got Winston Peters as an alternative. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly right. And you're, you're right too about, you know, politicians have to compromise all the time. That's why I'm never going to be a politician yeah. because I've got principles I will not uh, compromise on. And, you know, uh, part of the the rehabilitation of, of me and what I do around politics is that I've put faith at the centre of everything in my life. And so I won't compromise on that. Yeah. Um, you, you know, know you know. It's you know, something you, you, that's important, and and you can't, mm. you just can't uh, <laughs> be involved in politics and have faith uh, at the centre of your life. You, you know what? A lot of people, I think, would um, would would have a lot of scorn for you saying that you're putting faith at the centre of your life. What I always say mm. to people, though, is, you know, religion isn't like a club for people who are really good. It's a field hospital for for those of us who need to work on our lives constantly, you know, like it's, it's, a, it's for us, we, people like you and me, we need it because we need healing, you know, like we're, yeah. we're not great people, you know, we make mistakes, we've made mistakes, we've all made mistakes in our life. That's the reason to have faith, not because of, uh, you know, because you're uh, some pure and good person. And that's the reason why I don't like politicians talking about it because they're never talking about it in terms of their own need for salvation or healing 
or to be fixed in some way. They always use it as a, uh, you know, as an example of why they are good people, why the what's what's good about them, not what's bad about them. Well, so they people, should just not talk about it. Exactly, and you know, pe- people forget though. Jesus said, himself said that he, without sin, cast the first mm. stone, and he was it, in that. He was there in the crowd, and he didn't pick a stone up either. Yeah, right. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, mm-hmm. and that's the thing, you know, the mm. the church I go to um, every Saturday. We've got a big sign up, um, you know, it's in Papatoi. It's got a big yeah. sign up and it says, come as you are. Come a a, a, a Seventh-day yeah. seventh yeah. Adventist. Yep, oh, Seventh-day cool. Adventist, yep. yep. So, you know, come as you are. And there's all types that come there, you know, gang members wearing patches and stuff like yep. that. Yep. Uh, it's, a field, and, it's a field hospital. It's a field hospital. Right. For we're, we're all sinners. But that's the other thing, too, that I find a lot of people don't understand what the word sin is. I mean, for a start, the word sin in English didn't exist before um, about 900 AD, right? It's a Is that proto- right? It's a proto-Germanic word. Okay. Uh, the original Greek from the Bible and translations means to miss the mark, right? Yes. And so, ah. so for me being, this will be hard for you as a Catholic, right? <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> right. A lot of things but, are hard for me as a Catholic. <laughs> but, but I look at it in, in a shooting analogy, right? So if I go out to the gun club, and I'm shooting a uh, trench. There's 25 uh, targets, and I do it, and I shoot, and I shoot 20 out of 25. Do I now like pack up and go? I'm not very good at this. I'm, I'll quit now. Mm. Uh, I missed the mark on on four, yeah. on five of those targets. Mm. Or it'll always be shooting, you know, at a target downrange somewhere, and you get, you know, out of a hundred, you might get 95. Do you now pack up your rifle and go on? Yeah. Do any more of that, or do you keep practicing? And try and hit the mark more. Yeah, or, that's a ter- right? that's a terrific analogy. Yeah, I might just steal that one at some point. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, that's what I do. I have these mm. discussions all the time with friends and people, and they're going, "Oh, you know, but yeah, you, know, you say you're a Christian, but you do this and you do that." Yeah. I said, "Yeah, yeah, I missed the mark, but yeah. you know, I'm trying to minimize that." Imagine how bad I would be if I wasn't a Christian. That's what I say to people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can really see some bad stuff then. (laughs) And and for years, you know, I was a token Christian. I'd say I was a Christian. Mm. Uh, I changed all of that in the last couple of years. Good for you, mate. I'll tell you what focuses your mind, nearly dying. Yeah. Well, I came within a gnat's whisker uh, Mm. of dying, and uh, you sit there and take stock, and uh, I decided to make some changes. It took me five years to make those changes. Yeah, but you know, I think I'm in a better place now because of that. Well, you, you certainly seem very philosophical now, um, <laughs> you know, and um, and good on you. Like, and, like, but we're all a work in progress, right? Like, it's just that, unfortunately for you, Cameron, is that you know you you're a work in progress in public, and yeah. you know, and you know, if you the, the mistakes I make in life that. You know, I don't. I, they're private. You know, people don't uh, aren't jumping mm. all over me. I mean, one day I'll make a really bad, bad mistake, and then I've got enough enemies at this point to, that they'll really go for me in public. But you know, like it must be an additional burden just knowing that um, you know because of your b- political blogging, you've just got people who are re- willing to pounce on everything you, you're willing to every misstep you make. Uh, and you know, the, I guess the big, the big thing is, is, I hope you just don't care about them anymore, or don't care about what those people think. No, I don't care about them. Um, I, you know, I get every time I say something on X, yeah, you know, you'll get somebody who says, "Oh, you're irrelevant," or uh, yeah. it, almost everything you say is wrong. And then my response to them now, I mean, before I would have attacked them or ridiculed them. Yeah. Now I either ignore them or I just say, "And yet here you are." Yeah. Great. <laughs> <laughs> shall we um shall we talk about the election a bit more? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, now you've written a, a memo to Christopher Luxon on your Substack, the Blue Review. Tell us about that. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, I think um fundamentally this election, Labour lost the election because people, you know, have just lost faith in Labour's ability to deliver things that matter, right? Like, you know, we talk endlessly about all this, you know, the the, the debate meant this and the debate meant that, or look at this, um, you know, misstep that happened. But, you know, people people can't afford to fill up their cars with petrol, you know? Like it's, you know, the the pain at the pump, the pain at the grocery toll matters so much more 
the fear of going to the hospital ED waiting room matters so much more than anything else. So the first mandate that Luxon's got, I think, is that he just has to somehow, and I'm, I'm not hopeful even really that he can do it, but they've, they've got to concentrate on fixing those, but getting the basics right. Now, you might say, uh, and plenty of people on the right will say, well, you're just promising to manage stuff better that already exists. And it's like, yeah, actually, that's the first thing, right? Mm. Like, you know, first first prove that you can be competent and then people might trust you to implement, you know, more changes. But you've got to, if, if National can't get on top of the cost of the living crisis and broken public services, they're, they're going to they're look like a one-term government very, very fast. Um there'll be lots of people who are going to be, you know, you know, you know how it is, you know, mm. a new government coming into place. There are jobs up for grabs for people on the right. Yeah. And there'd be a whole lot of people putting their hands up, wanting jobs, you know, uh, flooding in people who've been fair weather friends in, in the past, not principled enemies, but, you know, mm. sort of fair weather friends, they'll be coming in trying to sell the national party on, you know, doing this or that, or having some sort of vision about this. But I think that, I just think Lux and the testing of him in the next 12 months, he's going to have to work with Seymour and Peters and prioritize actually just making the, making those broken things work better. If he can do that, he'll get a big second um, re-election, and that's the time that you might try to implement some serious reforms. Yeah. But I mean, don't Matt, run before you can walk. Yeah, Matt McCartan uh, is the one who taught me an analogy that – New Zealand politics is a game of two halves. Uh, we have a three-year electoral cycle, um, but but each every three years is is a half of a game. So you get elected, yep. the voters uh, watch you in the first half of the game, the, the three first three years. If they think you're doing okay, then you get to play the second half, and you get another yep. three years. And if you've done okay in that, then they might let you play another game. But under MMP, we've never had a four-term government. The yeah. last four-term government we had was uh, Keith Holyoaks, uh, you know, which is decades ago. So the yeah. reality is, is you get to play a game and a half if you're partially competent. That's, if you're dreadfully it. incompetent, you get to play yeah. either a half game or you get a full game and then you don't get another one. <laughs> That's a good analogy. The way I often think about it is I've often thought about politics as being similar to a commercial lease. You know, you get, you got uh, yeah, three, five, three, five year, plus five plus five or, or three by three by three, you know? Yeah. And so you, you get three by three by three. So you get to renew it. Um, those three, those three times, but you're not allowed to exercise the right of renewal uh, unless you're not in breach. Right. So if you're, if you're in breach of, your, of as a, as a tenant, then the landlord can refuse, you know, yeah. to, to let you renew the lease. And that's kind of how it is, right? Yeah. Like the, it's a good analogy too. Yeah. There's there's not there's another depressing commercial lease analogy, uh, Cam, which is the ratchet clause. Um, <laughs> and the the ratchet clause is is the is the clause that says the rent can go one way. It can be increased on a yes. rent review, but it can never be decreased. It operates like a ratchet. And unfortunately, uh, and for for us, the ratchet effect in terms of commercial leases in terms of politics is is government programs, government right? Spending. Government spending yeah. can go one way. And then, you know, to get in, you've got to keep, keep promise to continue it. You've got to swallow the dead rat of working for families. Uh, and, uh, and that's where the pessimism comes in, I guess. But my, my, my view, to, my, my advice to national is, listen, you've got to get some runs on the board quickly on, on making things work because this country just feels so broken. You know, you we were talking before about how you had to go to the ED and you somehow got in, got in within 10 minutes but yeah, yeah. you know I, I, I was I, lucky I think yeah well must be because I've had to take my kids to the ED a couple of times in the last year and just you know the fear of going and having to wait with your kids and what's like purgatory sorry to use a catholic idea but you, you know the purgatory of the waiting room sitting there with all the drunks you know who are vomiting mm. their guts out and mm. and and you have to wait five six hours you know and you get to that that three hour point and you're thinking, do I just, is it fine? Do I just go home and come back, you know, go to the GP? I've waited for three hours. What, you know, what if they're going to call me in the next half an hour? That is the type of stuff I think that just makes New Zealanders in such a depressed mood at, at the moment. And I don't know how he's going to do it, but man, Peters, Seymour and um, Luxon have got to get some runs on the board on that type of stuff.
I mean, there are some huge things. That, you know, if we look at what Labor promised, they promised the earth in 2017 yeah. and did, did it again in 2020. And they, they delivered the leavings uh, of a post of a of a pothole basically in yeah. in terms of uh, achievement, and I'm not sure that they're going to be trusted for a long for a long long time. But that will only be true if what you say is correct. Yeah, that national gets the basics. I mean, we've gone from government spending of around sixty billion dollars, yeah, per annum, to a hundred and sixty billion. Yeah, I know. And we've got incredible. We've got no discernible increase in services or anything else. And it seems the only metric that the Labour government had was that we'll spend more money than you can imagine. It's incredible when you think about it. It's kind of like there's this New Zealand disease, you know, the New Zealand disease where you can, everything, everything, you know, everything costs more now, but you get less of it, you know, everything, everything is, is over, over budget, over, you know, behind schedule. And, you know, there's just, like nothing in this country works. That's how it feels. I don't know if that's the mood elsewhere in the Western world, but man, like it didn't, listen, it didn't feel that way when I was a kid. You know, like it just didn't feel that way then. Well, I'll give you a, a, a more personal analogy. I was born in Fiji, right? Yeah. And um, periodically I go back there and, and you know, five years ago, uh, I spent a considerable amount of time there in 2018, uh, came back and had a stroke. And then that's why I haven't been back since. But um, in Fiji, doing simple things is almost impossible. Like going to get a driver's license, right? You basically have to set aside at least a day to go to um, go and get into the queue. You have to queue to get into the queue. Yeah. And then you get given a number and you queue again to be called and you think you've got everything right, and then some guy sits there with a clipboard and a pen, and you get down the page and something's missing. And instead of mm-hmm. trying to solve it right then, and then he goes, oh, no, no, you haven't got this denied, and then you've yeah. got another day to do that. If you want to go to the bank, uh, if you're an ordinary citizen in Fiji, you want to go to the bank, there's queues out the door and around the corner. Now, yeah. this is the tragic thing about it, right, in Fiji. If you're a European and you go to the bank, they come out and pull you out of the queue and deal with you separately, which is appalling. Mm-hmm. But that's how yeah. they operate, right? And everything in Fiji grinds to a halt because of the bureaucracy. And I've yeah. been seeing over the last five, six years in New Zealand exactly the same thing happening with this overabundance of of bureaucracy and bureaucratic procedures and policy and it's grinding everything to a halt. And but it started 30 years ago. It started yeah. when Simon uh, Upton brought in the Resource mm-hmm. Management Act, the yep. single worst piece yep. of legislation ever to be foisted on the New Zealand population. And no one will so, do anything about it. So that's a classic example of a guy who's really clever, mm-hmm. you know, with all the right intentions. Yep. You know, g- give me give me a dummy who understands his limitations any day. I think yeah. uh, over a smart ass, you know, there's a, the Fiji thing. You've said is really interesting for, for two reasons. One, one quite personal. Um, she's a bit light on something personal for me. I took my kids on a, like a cheap Fiji holiday when I had yeah. um, th- three kids and um, like, it was a quite a, like, I don't mind telling you this. It was a time in my life and I was under a lot of, a lot of stress and I've sort of had a very bad anxiety disorder, which I had refused to do anything about to get it diagnosed. Typical Kiwi bloke. And I had, Yep, yep, you know, I, well, you know, just, you know, I just thought, you know, I just have to get through one more day, one more day, it'll be fine. And I had this horrible panic attack, you know, when I got to Fiji in the, at the resort and the, and I was convinced I was having a heart attack, which I just, I, you know. There, it's me. awful. I know what you mean. Yeah. It was like this most excruciating pain. But anyway, the, uh, the doctor in Fiji, he was really, the, in, the, um, in the resort, he was really nice. He, he said, oh, yes, I've been to Palmas North. That's a nice, quaint little place. I was like, well, okay. <laughs> but he said, listen, you have, you have to go to the um, to, to a medical center because nothing I'm going to tell you is going to convince you that you're not having a heart attack. You have to have an ECG. So I went there and they basically saw me straight away. They, you know, they dusted off this, you know, ancient machine like it was from the, you know, 1850s or whatever. And they gave me an ECG and 
they gave me a bill and I went up and, you know, paid the bill and all t- said and done, it was probably about 90 minutes, you know, had the reassurance that I didn't have a, wasn't having a heart attack. And it hadn't occurred to me till now, you know, that uh, for whatever reason, you know, like it would probably take, you know, I probably got the, the, the first class service there, right? Like that mm. was, if I was a Fijian, they would have told me to go home, right? Is yeah, that it probably how it would have been? It breaks my heart every time I go back to Fiji, uh, you know, and I, I do not usually go to the resorts, right? I, I was born in Suvo. Yeah. It feels like home when I get off the plane at the airport, you know, I get in the cab to take me to the hotel and the guy says, oh, where are you from? They always ask, want to know where you're from. And I always yeah. say, right here. Oh, yeah. you're, you're a Kaiviti, yes. And then, then they know to take me directly to where I'm going because they know where I'm going. I know where I'm yeah. going. But it breaks my heart when you see, like, I, I mean, the house that we lived in was in Suva Point. It's some of the most expensive real estate in Suva. Uh, you know, houses there are over a million dollars. Uh, Fijian, yep. uh, and yet 200 meters from there is the largest squatter settlement in Suva. Yeah, you no, know? and there are people living cheek by jowl, literally in in ramshackle huts. But you so, also look th- at that, and you see these kids coming out of there, yeah. going to school, and their shirts are immaculate and white, and yeah. they've got this beaming smile and this pride of going to school. And I sit there and I think, you know, Kiwis don't realise how well off we actually are. Yeah, I know. I couldn't agree more. And and I had I had conflicted feelings about the whole thing. Because, you know, I'm a bit of a cheapskate. And so, you know, it was something I promised the family we'd do, but I got the cheapest possible resort, right? So we, we got we got to the uh, Nandi Airport. <laughs> we got into the uh, exchange and uh, the, 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 sorry, the, um, the transfer. And, you know, like a whole lot of families and the resorts were nicer. It was not nice to begin with. And they got more and more dilapidated as we yeah. got on. And the kids were like, is this one ours? I was like, no, way too nice. Just wait. So we got, it was, it was fine. You know, it was a sort of, it was a comfortable sort of seventies era, quite family friendly one, but it was the first time I'd been overseas in a long time. First time I'd been to Fiji and the people were just so lovely and polite and, and, and it was a, the, the place was full of Australians, you know, like, you know, loud, obnoxious Australians. But we went for a walk along the um, along the coastline, the beach, and right right next to the resort, right next to it was where the you know like I guess the village where the all the yeah. people who worked there lived, and it was like from one thing to the next, you know, it was like comfortable, you know, um, you know, not luxury because it was a you know it was an older resort, but you know, western comfort right next to this grinding poverty, mm. uh, and yet the people who. Uh, you know, came who worked in the in the resort. You know, had no. They were lovely to our kids. They were lovely to us. They were lovely to the boorish, um, rude Australians who would just you know you know beckon to them and and things like that. And it was it was it really jarred with me as a Kiwi because of because I guess as New Zealanders we pride ourselves on sort of not having that sort of class awareness. Um, but and but at the same time, like presumably they were quite good jobs that, you know, people wanted and they wouldn't yeah. have otherwise. So I just felt conflicted about the, about the whole thing. But one thing you're really right about is that those communities, they really do pride and take, they take a lot of pride and they take a lot of, um, uh, What's the word? The word is gratitude in terms of the educational opportunity, yeah. opportunities that are available to them uh, when they are available, and we just take this for granted here. You know, we we are we are living off the capital of well, we've, we've the got hard situ- work of yeah. previous generations. Well, we've got a situation where more kids are not attending school than are attending school in some areas. Yeah, you know, and and, yeah. and you look at the kids in Fiji, and they're desperate to go to school and learn and. They see education as a way mm. out of the mire that they're in, and you know this is. Mm. You, know, you touched on why labour lost, and it wasn't just the lack of delivery, and it's exactly the same reason why Helen Clark lost in two thousand and eight. You know, they've talked a big game about lifting people out of poverty. You know, Chris Hipkins and the yeah. said we've done this, we've lifted mm. eighty thousand, whatever number, some fanciful number based on statistics, lifted out of poverty. But, yeah. but but I would bet you that not a single Labour politician or indeed any other politician in our parliament 
ever bothered to identify just one of those kids no. right? and go and ask them, how do you think, you know, you've been lifted out of poverty now, how do you feel? Because they'll say, well, mm. we haven't moved, we're in the same house, in the same street, with the same crime, going to the same rubbish schools, nothing's changed. And it's been do like you, that. Do you decades. remember, there was a blog post you wrote, it was a long time ago, it'd probably be like in 2014 or 2013, it just comes to mind, it was about, there was someone who had, like there was, they had got they gone to the media and they'd complained about the the, the national government mm. and and the local MP was Jacinda Ardern or she was you know she was the um, list MP who was you know standing locally or, or whatever yeah. and they'd gone to the MP the Labour MP to to Jacinda and Jacinda had said something like oh we can put you in touch with the media like that was the help that they had offered yeah. to to give them and then the person followed up with you. About how disappointing it was. Do you, do you remember that? that yeah, it was a lady who actually lived in uh, near out near Pukekohe, if I remember rightly. Yeah, and uh, you know, I did follow up with her. I went to her house and I saw how yep. she lived, and I and I spent some time with her. And she was gobsmacked that I was the only journalist. Yeah, that's who, right. Who had bothered to do anything like that? You know, see her as a person. Mm. Yeah, and, I, and it's funny you you say that. I, I thought the other day I must look that person up again and see how they're getting on. You know? Yeah, because um, they're a person. Because they're a real person. They're not just a statistic or a story yeah. or an illustration. You know, I think you're right on that. Do you know the other thing that's interesting though is um, when you talk about you know the bureaucracy and how hard it is to get things done. Is I think we take for granted that that's always going to be New Zealand's always going to be a first world country. And what I was thinking about, I'm, <laughs> we're a second world at the moment. But, you know, it's so interesting how Argentina, like, you know, around, before the Second World War, Argentina was more prosperous per capita than the United States, yeah. you know. It was it was, it was on the way to being an economic superpower. It was a really strong agricultural country like New Zealand. And and look at Argentina now, right? Like it's yeah. it, it can happen, you know, and it Venezuela. can happen here. Venezuela. Like Venezuela. Right? They've got oil, they've got abundant resources and yet they're yep. living in grinding poverty all because of a lack of leadership. Yeah. Depressing. So, so, you know, your, your memo to, to Christopher Luxon, that struck a chord. That's why I called you up and said, hey, uh -huh. let's, have it. let's talk about this. Um, you know, I worry too that national will be ground down yep. by the bureaucracy, by the intransigence of the civil servants who have their own agenda in there. You know, that's the thing. You can change the government, but you never change mm -hmm. the service. It's a blob, right? It's like fighting against the blob. The more yeah. you punch it, the, the, the more you get sucked into it and the tighter you get. And that's why I'm a, I'm a pessimist, right? Like I think you know, Damien Grant was having me on about how, you know, not being ambitious enough in terms of the education sector, something we've talked about today. Mm. But education reforms have to be implemented by school principals and school and boards teachers. and teachers. And unions. <laughs> And unions and and if, in in three years, you know, you can pass the law. In three years, you're not going to get the time to do to do that, and you, and and you're not going and to be able you to every force step of the way. Every step of the way, and you'll give up. You look you at know? charter schools, right? Yeah, the charter schools that were implemented did amazing things, and mm -hmm. then the government changed, and they were gone in a heartbeat. Yeah, because they only built twelve of them. You know, yeah. they didn't build it. They didn't make them too big to fail. That's the problem, right? And. Yeah, so See, I'm that's the one thing that that Labour are very, very good at doing. Right, they put things in place, yep. knowing that the National Party, because of they're a party of the status quo, will invariably just adopt it. And you you raised earlier, you know, working for families. Yeah, that was brought in. John Key was the leader of the National Party. He said it was communism by stealth, and we'd repeal it. And when when he got in into power. Yeah. He didn't repeal it. In fact, he extended it. So that's the ratchet effect. Yeah. It can, can move one way unless, and this is the, I don't, I don't want us to have this, but unless you have a giant crash. And, you know, we had a giant crash in, in, the, in the early 80s, mm. and that gives you the leeway to fix things, you know. It's, but, but, you know, you need that crisis before you have a paradigm shift. I mean, you, you know, you, things that can't, if they can't go on forever, it won't go on forever. But the fall, the crash is going to be, the correction is going to be really, really hard. It's going to be and, and we're going to have it, you know. Edu it has to happen. Education is a huge, I mean, you know, like we used to be world leaders in reading and maths. And it's just, 
you know, if you don't teach your own kids reading and maths down, there's just no guarantee they're going to be literate or, or numerate. You know, yeah, we, we have gone backwards so much on that. that. Well, that's the problem is, is that too many people in New Zealand now, and we saw this as a result of the COVID stuff, and, and it's really accelerated now. Too many people in New Zealand expect that the solutions for anything, whether it's the education of their children or um, the health of their children or anything else, uh, are completely reliant on the government and are aghast when there isn't someone from the government saying, hi, yeah. I'm from the government. <laughs> you know, Ronald Reagan said the yeah. nine most dreaded words in the English language are, hi, I'm from the government, I'm here to help you. Yeah. But we've, but we've, that's our culture now. We've, we've taught ourselves to be helpless like that, right? And it's a hard thing to unlearn. I mean, you know, we had constant, you know, three or so years, constant advertisements on television and politicians saying that these communities, you know, communities were vulnerable. Yeah. You know, if you tell someone they're vulnerable mm-hmm. for long enough, guess what? They'll become yeah. vulnerable. Yeah. Give a, give a dog a bad name, right? It's yeah. Just, it's, there's no difference. Yeah. It's, dogs, dogs aren't bad. Their owners are. Yeah. Yeah. That's very, very true. (laughs) So just a quick summary then to wrap up, because we've been talking for an hour or so, right? Yeah. You've got a a little bit of hope, but there's a sense sense of disappointment there with you on what you think might happen over the next three years. I'm just a a pessimist, right, for all the reasons we've talked about. I've, I've sort of been taking the view for a while now that forces and trends matter more than individual politicians. You need yeah. to have the right politician in place, but you know, it's it's the, the broader economic and social trends are going to lead to a certain place. And and when we get to the point that that's not no longer sustainable, then we'll see the change. And if I'm being honest with you, I think that the best thing that can be hoped for for the short term is not to make things worse, right? For a national party that will run things properly, that won't go out of its way to bring in new um, big spending programs or new social interventions. And, you know, you're just going to leave the rest up to, you know, up to the media, to the culture, to the com- communities to create the demand for the actual change. Yeah. If the knock on the National Party is that it runs communism better, I hope for a better run communist state. <laughs> you know, I'd, and, but, but one, one thing I can tell you is that if they don't deliver that, then we'll get the badly run version again. And it'll, it'll come sooner than you think. And then the minor parties will grow even more power. They will. They will. And, you know, maybe that's not the worst thing in the world, but I'm still enough of a true blue dairy farmer's son that, you know, I have hope for the National Party, but I don't expect much. Well, on that note, uh, Liam here, uh, thank you for coming on The Crunch and sharing your thoughts from a National Party perspective. My absolute pleasure. And I'm sorry it was so rambling, but uh, feel free to call me back anytime you want. No problems. Thanks a lot. Well, who knew a discussion about politics would get a little sidetracked with a discussion about faith and the journey we end up on as we discover our faith. But there you go. Faith can and does drive some of us to try and be better humans, even in politics. Tell me your thoughts on what Liam had to say by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. This is The Crunch with Cam Slater. Conversations with a side of controversy, right here on RCR.